All right, and we're back. Up next, we have Derek Gathright, who is a YUI core team member, who's uh, really helped take scroll view from beta to a much more finished product this year. And so he's going to give you a deep dive of it now. Welcome, Derek. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, this is a scroll view deep dive. And uh, to give you a little preview of what we're going to be talking about, of course, scroll view. But uh, more importantly, why scroll view? What's, what's neat about it? Why is it useful? Um, we'll show some demos, uh, review the architecture, the API methods, properties, and also look at some of the common configurations, plugins, as well as if you have a scroll view based application, how you can uh, correctly unit test it. And then also just review some of the tips, tricks, gotchas, common questions uh, that, I, that I commonly see about scroll view. And also look at its roadmap going forward. Um, and so a little bit about me. I, hi, I'm Derek Gathright. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, I'm a YUI core team member. Uh, have been for, I guess, about 18 months now. Um, the last six months, I've been primarily focusing on scroll view. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, working on button. So, uh, if you have any button-related questions, feel free to find me uh, after the talk as well. Um, and you can find me on Twitter and GitHub as at Derek. I guess you actually get back-to-back -back talks from people who have their first names on Twitter with Carity. Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, scroll view. What is it and why should you use it? So scroll view provides a cross-browser scrollable content widget uh, for mobile and desktop browsers. So it's great for small supplementary widgets like carousels and scrolling through lists of content, but you can also use it for much more advanced interface experiences. Uh, it's fast, efficient, and it's also unit tested. Uh, it's used across quite a few Yahoo products at this point, and it seems to be growing in popularity across Yahoo um, almost on a weekly basis. So some that you may have used uh, that make use of scroll view is uh, Yahoo Access, the iOS web browser, or yeah, web browser or web browser for iOS, Android, as well as browser extensions for desktop browsers. Uh, LiveStand, uh, pre, or yeah, when LiveStand was around, it used uh, Scroll View. Also on a variety of news and media properties and Yahoo Mail, um, and it's built, of course, on top of a very solid foundation, YUI. So, uh, what browsers does Scroll View support? Basically, everything that's out there. Um, everything from modern browsers to legacy browsers. Um, and it's designed with, uh, with mobile specifically in mind. Uh, but we're seeing more and more use cases for uh, non-touch interface uh, desktop browsers. So yeah, it's tested. As Dave mentioned before, we run um, apparently now millions of unit tests uh, monthly. So. Uh, scroll view is part of that testing. So let's look at some demos of what you can do with scroll view. So here's just a simple content widget that has lists of band names um, that is not actually, um, doesn't have any scroll view, uh, it doesn't have scroll view integrated into it. So um, there's not really any good way to use gestures to interact with this widget, because as you can see, when you click and try to drag, all you're doing is just selecting text. Uh, but now when we're becoming much more um, exposed and familiar with touch-based interfaces, we kind of expect that experience nowadays. So the only way to interact with this is actually just with the trackpad, mouse wheel, dragging the scroll bars up and down. Um, and yeah, and I guess mouse keys too. But so look, let's look and see what happens if we actually use scroll view for this widget. Um, so now we all of a sudden, if I click and drag, you can get dragging capabilities. And then if I release, it'll snap back to uh, the, the top of the list. And there's also um, momentum-based gesture interaction as well. So it's a much more natural uh, way to interact with lists of content. And mouse wheel also works with this too. So, but it's, and that's for a vertical list, but it's not only just for vertical lists of content. Uh, you can also use it for horizontal, uh, yeah, horizontal, horizontally laid out content as well. So in this example, we just have pictures almost in a, in a carousel like uh, widget that you could slide back and forth between. 
Um, and so those are just a few examples of simple widgets, but here's one that I threw together real quickly that is what I call the kitten refresher. Basically, it's a uh, pull to refresh interface that you see on many mobile applications now. So when I drag down and release, it's going to actually introduce some new kittens for us. Um, and just keep on doing it, and more and more bunnies, apparently, too. Um, <laughs> so these are all actually being pulled live from Flickr. Uh, so it's mostly people, I don't, yeah, I don't know why clouds are in there. But so it's just people tagging pictures with kittens on Flickr, hoping that they get more views from it, apparently. So, um, so if we continue to kind of go over some of the architecture, of scroll view, if you look at the uh, met, or if you look at the scroll view meta JSON file, you'll see just a, a general overview of what exactly it is that makes up scroll view. It's really just a combination of widget, gesture events, mouse mouse wheel, as well as transitions, and it kind of glues all of that together into um, a into a new widget. And, and so that. Scroll view base is the core module that you need to use uh, to use scroll view. But uh, there's also scroll view base IE, which handles some of the legacy IE support. And that's conditionally loaded. You don't have to worry about loading that module in. Uh, then there's also a couple plugins, scroll view scroll bars, which, is a scr which are scroll indicators that will show you where exactly in the scroll view your current content is scrolled to. Uh, then there's a popular plugin uh, that is the pagination plugin that will allow you to snap content uh, to various page offsets and boundaries. So, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, it uses it makes heavy use of widgets. So if you're going to interact with scroll view and, and use it in your application, it's really really helpful to know what exactly it is uh, that you're building on top of, which is widget. It's a foundation class that a lot of UI components and YUI are built on top of. You've probably used some of them before, like autocomplete, button, calendar, data table, and there's quite a few more. Uh, and so what does widget provide for you? It provides attributes, which hopefully you saw Luke's awesome talk uh, that basically told you everything you need to know about attributes. Uh, also event target for custom events. You get the ability to plug in, um, yeah, the ability to extend and plug in other modules and uh, classes. Then you also get lifecycle and abstract rendering methods. So you can tie into things like the initializer, the destruction uh, methods, and render UI, bind UI, and sync UI at various states uh, through the rendering cycle. Um, and so, yeah, read through the documentation on Widget if you're going to start heavily using scroll view, because that'll really help you out in terms of understanding how to most efficiently interact, uh, interact with scroll view. So if you're going uh, if you're going to build something with widget, here's just a really simple uh, basic example of creating a widget. So you have your uh, class constructor uh, at the top, and then you give it a name, some attributes, and then just extend it. And that will export a uh, y.myWidget um, object, which will then be available through the rest of your uh, YUI application. In terms of instantiating, why, or the y.myWidget that you created, simple, var myWidget equals new y.myWidget, and then you pass in a source node. That's something that all widgets require, is the source node, which is just a CSS selector. Um, and then you take that object, and then you run the render method on, on it. So if you're going to create scroll view, it's basically the exact same thing. Um, just use scroll view, which is the uh, scroll view or scroll view base, depending on whether you want scroll indicators or not. Um, and yeah, yeah, render it, and then there you go. You get a scroll view, uh, scroll view interface. So taking a look at the API for scroll view, uh, some of the methods, properties, and events that you're going to get um, includes everything from y.widget, um, which that in turn inherits from y.base. So kind of goes down the stack a little ways. Um, but you get a, a couple additional APIs. So scroll to, that's going to tell you where or you're going to be able to tell scroll view where exactly to um, animate to or instantly jump to a specific offset uh, within your content. Last scroll to mount is a property that will actually tell you uh, how far the last interaction, um, yeah, how, how many pixels the last interaction uh, scrolled across. Then 
You, there's also a very useful event, which is scroll end, and that is going to allow you to tie into the end of any animation uh, that occurs. So once the animation is complete, then it's going to go ahead and call this callback function that you, uh, that you uh, register with it. So some of the attributes that you're going to get with scroll view, um, there's quite a few. There's four really important ones, though. Axis, flick, scroll X, and scroll Y. So scroll X and scroll Y are really just the current offsets of where you are in your widget. Um, then flick is uh, a, yeah, flick is a, actually, I think we're going to review um, what each one of these does in a second. So let me skip on to the next slide then. So configuring scroll view. Um, yeah, so here we go. The axis and flick uh, configuration um, options are exampled here. So axis was something that was added in 3.7. Prior to 3.7, if you're using uh, 3.6.1 and below, it's still going to auto-calculate the axis based off of where more of the overflow content is. Sometimes uh, it would get a little bit confusing on or sometimes it might get a little bit confusing if you have a widget that is exactly 400 pixels by 400 pixels. It would default to either X or Y, and sometimes it was desirable to have it the opposite way. So I figure I might as well just go ahead and expose the, uh, the axis attribute. So, um, and you can also uh, specify XY, which is a dual axis pattern, or which is a dual axis scroll view that I'll demonstrate later. Uh, with Flick, you have minimum distance and minimum velocity uh, that basically says you need to go across this threshold on speed and distance in order for it to actually register a flick event. Uh, and then you can also specify which axis for it to go across. Um, say, for example, you don't even want drag or flick. Now, why would you not want drag or flick? Any, any, any ideas? What's that? Okay. Possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of different, actually, yeah, there's quite a few different uh, instances where you might want it. Uh, one that I see it mostly, most used on is for carousels. Um, if you have API interaction, you, um, you don't want the user to kind of get confused on um, how do I interact with this? Do I drag it? Do, what exactly do I do? But you have buttons either on the left or to the right or above or below and uh, to go back and forth. So it's used a lot for carousels. Um, so you can also tweak the physics of scroll view. So uh, frame duration is the millisecond interval between frames. There's a JS timer that's running that will basically go through and do the animation for you. And so if you specify it as five, you're going to get five millisecond frames, uh, assuming your browser is capable of handling that speed. Um, Deceleration is the drag coefficient. That's basically going to say how sticky or how smooth um, the, uh, the the content will uh, yeah the content will slow down when you flick it. Um, then you can also specify an, uh, easing, which will you can do common things like ease in, ease out, as well as provide cubic Bezier formulas. Um, that I can cover right now too. So if you're not familiar with cubic Bezier form uh, or Bezier curves. Basically, these are what allow you to specify the animation flow of the content when, when it's going through the flick uh, animation. So some really common ones that you may have used before, like linear, ease in and ease out. Um, but those are really just sugar for the specific formulas that you see. Um, that you see. So uh, I think the, the GIF or the, yeah, the image does a pretty good example of demonstrating how exactly it goes through and calculates the flow. Uh, but just a real quick overview, uh, you specify two XY coordinates. So that will be P1 and P2. P0 and P3 are uh, default to 0, 0, and 1, 1. Those are, that's the beginning and end of your curves. So a good way to get experience with uh, cubic Bezier. Um, Nope, let's go back. Let's see if I can click on it correctly this time. Yeah. So here's a really cool uh, Cubic Bezier builder that I came across that allows you to go through and drag the, uh, drag the P1 and P2 
uh, coordinates, and then you can see that animation um, compared to other commonly used ones like linear, ease in, ease out. So if we click that, then you'll see it, exactly what that transition is going to look like. You can modify it, and so this one is going to accelerate really quite, really quickly, and then slow down. Um, yeah, so that playing around with these is will if you're really looking for, um, I, I guess, if you're really looking to customize the transition capabilities of Scroll View, uh, sp uh, specifying the uh, easing curves is a uh, is a really good way to accomplish that. So. As I mentioned before, uh, ScrollView has two plugins. There's ScrollView Scrollbars as well as ScrollView Paginator. So we can take a look at a couple of those. Uh, ScrollView Paginator adds in pagination support. So ScrollView will snap to uh, discrete page boundaries as opposed to scrolling continuously. So it's that, that plugin is going to add in a couple attributes, um, axis, selector, uh, index and total axis is the pagination axis, which may or may not be the same as the uh, scroll view base axis that you defined. Selector it is most commonly going to be just li, which um, you can also have other uh, whatever other selector specifies the um, the child elements that um, refers to each page in your content. Uh, index is going to be the current offset of the of the pagination. Uh, so if you're on the third page, it's the index is going to be two because uh, offset zero. Uh, then there's also total, which is the total number of pages that you have within your content. Uh, these are attributes. So if you uh, so total, you might actually there, I, yeah, there could be some instances where you might want to set total as opposed to get um, only getting it, but it was um, methods. You get scroll to index, which is similar to scroll view bases. Uh, scroll to, which, as you remember, uh, takes an x y coordinate, but scroll to index really just takes a page index. So you can say scroll to index three, and that's going to scroll to the third page. Um, next and previous will go to obviously the next and previous pages. Um, so in order to use Paginator, um, it's really easy. Just include the uh, scroll view Paginator um, within, yeah, within your use statement. Then uh, with scrollview.plug, specify that that's the uh, plugin method or plugin object. And then uh, specify your, within your configuration object the selector, which we're going to select all of the uh, child LI elements because most often it's used uh, where the parent is um, ULs. So, and then uh, same as before, just render, and then you have a paginated instance. And uh, yeah, and so I already went through some of the uh, some of the API methods there. So, if we look at what we had with a continuous scroll view, um, basically that's what you get. You can stop in the middle of two pages, but if you're looking if you're looking at a, a picture carousel slideshow it probably makes most sense to use something like Paginator. So if we look at what that same widget uh, looks like and behaves, but with pagination abilities, then um, even if I let it go right here, it's going to snap to the nearest pages. Then you also, as I mentioned, have um, next and previous, which will go back and forth between next and previous pages, as well as Here's one I threw in there. It'll go to the third page. So nothing too crazy or fancy, but very useful for carousels. And uh, so there's also a second plugin. Um, this one's a lot more straightforward. There's really no API for you to interact with. Um, yeah, if you just include um, scroll view in your use statement as opposed to scroll view base, scroll, the scroll view module will plug in, scroll in the scroll indicator um, already for you. Then you're going to get, um, I believe it was shown. Yeah, so this one, yeah, so you see the scroll indicator at the bottom. You can easily turn that off if you don't want it um, by including scroll view base as opposed to scroll view. So um, unit testing. Uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, unit testing is really, really important to all the code that we create because 
The more code that we have unit tested, that means the less manual testing that we're gonna have to do, which means we can in turn move a lot faster and we can be more confident that what we're creating is not breaking stuff that uh, is already out there. So um, scroll view is actually one of the last modules that actually got a, a good amount of coverage. And um, that was a bit of a problem because we were spending so much time manually testing scroll view because there's so many different combinations of configuration options that you can do. You can have vertical, you can have horizontal, you can have dual axis, you can have paginated and non-paginated, um, and you can interact with it via gestures and um, as well as an API, and it just became to be really burdensome. So finally said, screw it, we're gonna do what we can to get this thing automated and testable. So. Um, and once we were able to do that, it, it really helped out the confidence of what we were creating, wasn't actually breaking stuff. So um, we didn't get, the, or the reason why we weren't able to get unit testing into scroll view until 3.7 was because we didn't actually have any way to do it. Uh, it wasn't until uh, Gesture Simulate landed, uh, which is a new module, and that allowed us to finally be able to test swiping and flicking and dragging content around. Uh, because prior to that, all we could do is just test out the APIs, scroll to index, scroll to, and testing out some of the attribute setters. But uh, at least on the two core modules now with scroll view base and scroll view paginator, we're now at 80%. We'd hopefully get that up uh, quite a bit higher in the near future. Uh, and that really helps out, like I mentioned before, on knowing that what we're shipping is not actually breaking current implementations out there. So. Uh, you can look at the tests uh, in, in the YUI source tree. Um, yeah, and so an example of testing scroll view, if you have scroll view based widgets that you also want to add uh, unit testing for, which is a really good idea, by the way, um, here's an example of using gesture simulate to actually test your code. So um, I just rendering a scroll view with a general utility method, render vertical scroll view. And I'm gonna say I want it to go a distance of 500 pixels. So I use, I tie into the scroll end method. Um, so when scrolling is complete, I wanna make sure that it's gone at least 500 pixels. And this is also a good example of asynchronous testing too um, that you can do in YUI test. So um, as you'll see down near the bottom, there's scroll view .get content box. Uh, then I'm running simulate gesture move across that. So that's the, that's the outer content box of the scroll view widget, simulating a move gesture, giving it a path of negative uh, 500 pixels, which means it's going the opposite direction, uh, dragging in the opposite direction, I meaning it's gonna go forward 500 pixels, and a duration of 100 milliseconds. So, uh, that animation is gonna complete, which is then gonna then fire scroll end, and then test and make sure that the scroll Y offset is actually greater or equal to 500 pixels. And that test now passes currently. <laughs> um, so simulate gesture is still very young. Uh, we don't have any documentation or user guide out there yet. Hopefully we'll get that soon. Um, but yeah, so the best documentation as always is the source code. Uh, so if you need to be able to gest or simulate gestures in your unit test, even outside of scroll view, but in any other uh, touch-based uh, applications that you have, uh, take advantage of gesture simulate. It's pretty cool. So um, tips, tricks, questions, things that I commonly hear about it um, to, yeah, maybe help you out with some of your scroll view implementations that you already have or will create in the near future. Uh, DOM optimization, that was something that we um, worked on quite a bit, uh, Satyan specifically, uh, with the LiveStand team. And there was a good talk last year at YUIConf, um, LiveStand Learnings, I believe is, was the title. So you'll, if you watch that, you'll learn a lot about um, kind of the, the findings of working on that LiveStand project. Um, so a, a, a common problem if you're creating a a uh, mobile-based application that uses scroll view as its primary interface is um, as you load more and more content into it, especially larger pictures, um, it becomes easy to fill up the, the GPU memory. And when that happens on mobile devices, basically what happens is the browser just crashes and then you just go back to the home screen. Uh, so 
managing that memory consumption in the GPU um, is, is pretty important so you don't actually overload and crash the browser. So how do you do that with scroll view? Well, it's something that uh, worked on, I don't know, is Michael Ridgway in the, in the room? Maybe, I don't know. Michael's running around here somewhere. He, he helped me out quite a bit on this too, as well as Adriano Castro, two other yahoos. Um, so we developed a, uh, a, um, a feature within scroll view. It's, you can trigger it with the optimized memory true flag in your scroll view configuration. It, it's an underscored configuration attribute right now because we don't intend for it to actually be part of the scroll view API because once we actually get it stable, tested, and we're confident that we know it's working in the most efficient manner, there's no need for that API there because there's no reason why you would not want it to be as, um, as memory efficient as, as possible. So it's in there currently. You, uh, I'd love for you guys to test it out, play around with it, see if you can find any issues. Um, and yeah, eventually we'll, uh, we'll probably just remove that optimization flag and then it'll be optimized by default. So um, here's one and I'm gonna go ahead and um, show a demo of that memory optimization and how it works. So as you'll see here, here's all of the, all of these LI elements are the pages in scroll view. And all of them, so let's see, uh, page zero and page one um, don't have this YUI3 scroll view hidden class applied to it, but everything else after it does. So as I scroll through these pages, you're gonna see the, uh, that class get applied to anything previous, um, or anything outside of the one before and one after. So now page zero, one, two, and uh, page zero, one, and two are all visible. Uh, but now that I'm on page three, page zero becomes invisible. And as I scroll through, you're gonna see all of those. Um, yeah, you'll see that class get toggled on anything that's not next to the visible nodes. And the APIs work fine with it. So if I go to say, let's see, scroll, uh, go to, let's go further down. And then it even works with set index. So right now, um, Page three is hidden and everything around it is hidden, but when I hit go to three, it's gonna jump over there and it, in the process of transitioning over there, it's going to hide everything that it came from, make, make all the pages visible that it's going to, and um, it works mostly seamlessly, um, but it, there was a little bit of, a, of some white space in there that you may have seen. So, that basically gives you an idea of, uh, of the DOM optimization and what it's actually doing. Right now it's using uh, visibility hidden, but we've also experimented with re completely removing items from the DOM as well as display none. Uh, the visibility hidden is, um, was the easiest uh, implementation because it leaves the, uh, the offsets. Uh, it, yeah, so it's still uh, blocked out in the rendering tree, but it's just not filling up the GPU with all of the, uh, the overhead and, uh, from the content that's inside of that block. So another problem that um, run into occasionally is lazy loading. So when you render scroll view, it's gonna auto calculate the minimum and maximum boundaries and pagination offsets if you have the pagination plugin applied. Um, so if the widget content changes, uh, or if, con if the size of the content inside the widget changes, then the um, height and width values are gonna be out of sync. Uh, so let me think. Uh, yeah, we ran into, oh, I'll show you how to um, at least fix this one real quick, and then we can talk about some of the examples of when, when you might run into it. So anytime you change the, the size of the content inside of scroll view, just run sync UI, that's all you have to do. That's actually what's running when scroll view is rendered the first time. Um, and then it's gonna calculate max scroll X, max scroll Y. And so if you throw a whole bunch of new content inside of scroll view, run sync UI again. And it's really cheap and easy uh, and it will automatically recalculate the boundaries for you. So um, one, common uh, problem that I've seen with some implementations is that uh, with image tags that are not, that don't have the height and width attributes specified, um, 
And especially on like slower mobile devices where it's downloading images off of a cell network uh, that maybe aren't gonna block out the appropriate size prior to scroll view rendering, um, once those images or fill up the fill up the scroll view space, then the the max x and max y values are going to be out of date. So um, always, when possible, at least if you know the height and width of your images, specify those. It's even it's a good idea even to do it outside of scroll view, but especially good within scroll view environments because then you're not going to have to worry about um, about those values being out of sync if the images are slow to load. Um, right to left layout. So. Um, say you uh, working on a right to left, uh, or your target audience needs right, uh, uses a right to left language layout. Uh, then, yeah, this was added in three three seven zero. Yeah, it's pretty easy now to get support for that because you don't actually have to do anything. Prior to three seven, it did it definitely did require kind of some hackery and trickery to get it to flow or right to left as opposed to the um, uh, left to right. So uh, now supports right to left layouts. Um, accessibility. How can you make scroll view content accessible to screen readers because it's hidden off the page? It's when you think about it, it's actually you don't have to do anything because scroll view is just a visual only interface enhancement. It doesn't modify any of the underlying DOM structure and DOM elements. So you're not gonna. There's nothing you need to do to get it to support for standard implementations, um, accessibility in screen readers. Um, another common um, use case that we've seen in the past with, uh, with scroll view is nested scroll view. So you need to be able to scroll X and Y. Um, and so in order to do that, basically you would do a scroll view uh, inside of a scroll view. One would be X, then the other one would be Y. And it worked. It it would just added an additional maintenance overhead, and it was a little bit. It was a yeah. It was a little bit tricky uh, sometimes, and it along with just the maintenance overhead, you also had the performance cost because instead of one widget, you now have two widgets, and both of them are trying to listen for events inside of it. Um, so uh, with as of three seven, you don't actually have to use nested scroll views. Now, somebody could probably come up with a use case for um, why you would still need nested scroll views, but for the most part, uh, you don't anymore because it, scroll view now supports scrolling on the X and Y axis. So to show a demo of how that works, you basically, so here's a dual axis continuous um, example. So scroll down, scroll right. And so you now have and this is continuous, so it's not snapping to specific pages, but you now have a con uh, you now have a content area that you could scroll anywhere inside of it, and you get the uh, and you also get the gesture, momentum, flicking, and everything. Um, now, one of the problems here is that okay, this doesn't really this is yeah this doesn't really work too well if you need to have each of these on specific pages um, because when you scroll down one, it's going to scroll down the others and yeah, you need to be at the top of here. So if we add in paginator, um, so here's a dual axis paginated instance. Um, so as you scroll down, same behavior as before, but if we scroll down to the bottom of this and we scroll over, now all of a sudden we're at the top of card two. These are on independent axes. Um, and you can scroll as far away as you want to and it still remembers where each of the uh, previous Y offsets were. So this is pretty neat. And uh, th so that was for horizontally paginated content, uh, which is the vast majority of, of use cases. But I don't know, you, could, you might still need a, a use case for a paginated vertical instance. So uh, here's, here's another silly little quick example that I threw together um, to scroll through. Uh, Place kitten images. If you don't know Place kitten, it's really awesome. Uh, you should check it out. Placekitten.com, I think. I don't know. Um, allows you to just throw in little placeholders of cute little kittens. Uh, so, as we, as you can see, we're scrolling vertically on on. Sorry, the the vertical scrolling is paginated, but if we scroll left and right, then all of a sudden it's continuous, and you can scroll up, and all of these still have and maintain their own specific offsets. So. 
you can get kind of crazy and do some interesting interfaces with this stuff. So that gives you an example of dual axis pagination on a vertical uh, instance. So another, um, another really helpful tip when developing Scrovy-based applications is debugging. Really get familiar with Chrome DevTools, Inspector, Firebug, whatever your browser of choice is, um, because that re being able to see what is going on inside of scroll view as your application is running is very, very helpful. So um, I love using Chrome to live edit the code. And um, if, if I'm on, say, I don't know, some, some project that, does it, that I don't have access to edit the, uh, the source code on the servers, uh, but I still want to interact with the sandboxed scroll view instance, how am I actually going to get in there to do it? Well, um, li use Chrome's live editing to hop in, set a breakpoint uh, before, uh, yeah, set a breakpoint before scroll view is instantiated, um, bind it to, say, window.sv equals scroll view that you've already created, um, on, yeah, then resume running the code, and then boom, all of a sudden you now have access to uh, your scroll view instance from the browser console. And from there, you can hop in and check out some of the attributes like scroll X and Y to see what the current offsets are. But there's also a number of uh, uh, protected and private properties and methods that you can use as well. So min scroll X and min scroll Y uh, for X and Y. Uh, sorry, yeah, min scroll X and max scroll X and Y uh, those are both really useful if you're scrolling to the edge of the content, but it's um, or what you expect to be the edge of the content, but it's snapping before it gets there. Uh, those are two really good properties to take a look at if uh, you're uh, if you're expecting the boundary to be a thousand pixels over, but it's only 500. Well, then that goes back to probably some of the lazy loading tips that I that I showed before, or um, figuring out where in the rendering it's not actually picking up that additional uh, 500, uh, 500 pixels. Um, is out of bounds is just kind of sugar wrapped around um, checking to make sure that where you are is actually within bounds of what scroll view knows about. Um, with pa the paginator plugin, page dims is a really good um, Protected, uh, protected array that stores all of the offsets of where uh, where scroll view should snap to. So, um, what's next with scroll view? Uh, get it out of beta. It's still like some of the other UI uh, UI widgets that are within YUI. It still has a beta tag. Uh, this is because. While we're confident that it's stable and it's, it's production quality ready, there's dozens of Yahoo products and applications and even non-Yahoo implementations of it um, that, that work great, but we're still not where we want it to be in terms of performance and as well as we're not positive that the APIs uh, are never gonna change. So uh, another aspect of getting it out of beta is improved test coverage, both on the functional and unit tests. Uh, right now, it has good test coverage, but it's not great. Well, we, we hope to get it to the great level. And also provide some more examples. Uh, right now on, on yuilibrary.com, we have four examples of how to use scroll view, but there's so many other things that you can do with scroll view that I mentioned before, the dual axis right to left, lazy loading, and I could just pull to refresh. All of this stuff um, where I have basic demos in this slideshow um, that I'd love to get in there uh, as examples on the website. And if, if you guys have any, uh, send a pull request with the new example. And uh, yeah, we can work to get it on the website. Uh, memory optimization on by default. As I mentioned before, that's something that you don't want it to not be efficient by default. And so once we figure out and are confident that we have the, the most efficient, stable um, implementation of the DOM optimization, we'll throw it in there and it'll be turned on. Uh, benchmarking and performance enhancements. As we're going through and doing performance tweaks, we uh, need to have previous benchmark uh, numbers to reference off of. So uh, that will allow us to be confident that where we're going is actually improving the speed of scroll view, improving the frame rate, as opposed to slowing it down. 
And um, another uh, thing that we're experimenting with is CSS animated flicks, where uh, instead of using the JS timer, where you have that frame duration uh, configuration attribute that I mentioned before, if we're using CSS to do the transitions, then we don't actually have to use a JS timer. And at that point, it's running as fast as the browser can possibly take it. Um, so when we get that in there, that'll be really helpful. If we have time at the end, I'll show you a quick little demo of that. Um, WebKit overflow scrolling touch. It's a common question. Like, oh, does scroll view use WebKit overflow, scroll, uh, WebKit overflow scrolling touch? Such a mouthful. Uh, does that use it under the hood? At this point, no. Uh, that's something that we've been consider that we've not considering, but that we've played around with a little bit. But um, the the um, the adoption of and stability of that um, style is still kind of limited. So it's not quite where we need it to be for to be able to expect it to be useful on uh, all applications. So at some point, I'm confident that it'll get there in iOS as well as Android and hopefully to other browsers. And uh, that's really what scroll view is. It um, does that same concept, but also adds in the API uh, capabilities. So you can easily get the current offsets. So uh, if we do go ahead and implement overflow scrolling touch, then we need to make sure that the API holds up throughout. Um, and yeah, so uh, conclusion. So what did we learn? We learned scroll view's purpose, why you would want to use it, how it's useful, and how it's awesome. Um, reviewed some of the architecture, API, plugins, uh, simulating, uh, doing unit tests by simulating gestures that's useful both within scroll view as well as in any other applications that you have. Um, we reviewed solutions to some of the common questions and, and problems that people can run into, um, as well as reviewed Scrollview's roadmap. And um, yeah, so that is, that is all I have for you today with Scrollview, but I'm happy to take any questions too. So. Are there any questions for Derek? Is Gamiel in here, by the way? Oh good, can you just check in back there for me? So I know it's a little counter to the purpose of scroll view. It's called scroll view after all. But since it is the best carousel-like component in YUI right now, um, have you given any thought to different types of transitions between pages, essentially? Um, you know, like transitioning, crossfades, um, stuff other than scrolling left and right, that sort of thing. No, actually, I haven't thought about that before. But uh, no, I interesting. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know how you would make it work given how scroll view is put together right now. Yeah, um, yeah. But as a future project, it might be interesting to kind of abstract out the, uh, well, the pagination stuff is already a plugin, so maybe that doesn't work. But yeah. some sort of carousel upper level component that handles that sort of stuff and then lets you plug in different types of transitions between content. Yeah, yeah. And so scroll view right now, and the, the way it's set up and architected and structured, um, it's pretty set in its way, so I'm not sure. It might be possible to do some different transitions, but yeah, I'd have to think about that a little more. But um, to be able to do scroll view-like things, there are certainly different um, approaches that we could take, that, and I've experimented with some of them. Basically, um, you, uh, you separate out the, the, the touch layer from scroll view, uh, or sorry, you separate out the touch layer from the underlying content. So basically, the best way to think of it is you're just interacting with a touchpad, like a piece of an imaginary piece of glass, and that is then what is interacting with the content beneath it. And basically, scrolling it left or right, or up or down, or or whatever you want to do. Um, you can even have it when you scroll left, it'll. Yeah, you can have it go inverse. You can have it do all these different types of things. And so if we abstracted out the, the touch layer from uh, the anything, in, it's mostly separate right now, but there still could be a little bit more work done. But anyways, so that's, that's a concept that, I've, that we've, and I even have some experiments with it too. So um, yeah, I don't know. So there's a lot of kind of unique and neat things we can do with scroll view. And I think transitions as well as, um, yeah, doing some of the maybe, I don't know, more experimental ways of interacting with the content beneath it and making it do different things would be pretty neat. So, yeah. Thanks. 
Anyone else? Hi. Have you begun to look at uh, Windows Phone 8 or Windows tablet yeah. at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see. Yeah, we have five minutes. Uh, Tilo is going to be doing a talk tomorrow. Is that right, Tilo? Yeah. Okay, so Tilo is going to be doing a talk tomorrow um, about all the Windows 8 stuff uh, that we've been doing on the team. So the 3.7.3 release was actually our Windows 8 release that would bring um, Windows 8 compatibility to uh, YUI 3.7. So um, within scroll view, yeah, it, there was no tweaks or modifications that needed to be done to get it to work on Windows 8. It just works. And that's the awesome thing about scroll view is it works across all the different platforms that are out there because it's just using all of the, the components that are currently within YUI, like transition. Uh, when Transition supports new browsers and new devices that are coming out, Scroll View will in turn support it as well. So, yeah, with Windows 8, you can create great, uh, great Windows 8 Scroll View based applications without, um, without much fuss or an issue, and it'll work across all the other devices as well. So, okay, thanks. Yep. Um, in cases where we don't know the image size ahead of time, have mm -hmm. you heard of anyone having success with the image loaded event? Uh, for the, um, yeah, actually for the, for the pull to refresh example, um, I believe, if, if I think I can pull it up here, and I believe I am actually using that. So, because that was an issue I was running into, because I, I coded up the pull to refresh example at Starbucks, which had crappy Wi-Fi. Um, and so <laughs> um, the images, so scroll view was rendering before the images would actually be in there. And so I actually had to tie in and figure out, um, yeah, the, the height of it. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm basically doing image on load here, and um, which is then running set cat. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it's really helpful if you know the height and width beforehand. And if you're talking to an API, um, ha make sure that API is giving you the height and width uh, properties and attributes um, that you can then feed into your layout. Um, yeah, so. Uh, hi. Uh, is there support for um, multi-row carousels with infinite scroll? So, uh, say that again. Multi multi-row carousels. multi-row carousels um, uh, with, with infinite scrolling. You could. Hmm. It's an interesting one. I hadn't thought about the multi-row carousels before. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you. So, uh, as I mentioned before, there's probably uh, instances where you can think of nested carousel or nested scroll views inside of scroll views, and that could probably be one of them. I think currently um, it wouldn't support multi rows uh, because then you're talking about different offsets per row. But yeah, um, I don't know. I'll, I'll think about that some more. It's an interesting one. Yeah, basically the uh, slot machine turned 90 degrees. Um, yeah. Any final questions? Yeah. I was just going to say I wrote something for that, so I can. Well, there we go. How, how did talk you to do you afterwards? How, how we have we have like one minute. How, uh, um, on the uh, horizontal flick, I prevented any vertical um, uh, vertical gestures, so then it captures the scroll view horizontally. The only bug in it, of course, is when you move. At a forty-five degree angle, you—it's kind of hit or miss which one you're which one you're doing. So yeah, it was just a hack that I just threw together really quick. So it, it obviously needs some work, but yeah. And so that's a good example of uh, of what I was talking about about five minutes ago, which is abstracting out what you're doing at the at the at the touch level from anything that it's doing underneath at the DOM level to modify the content. So. Uh, that would be an example of one where it doesn't matter what direction you're moving your finger at, what the interaction is, but basically your own specific application logic is going to figure out what exactly it should do with those gestures um, at the top level. So, yeah. He'll put it up on GitHub or Gallery soon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Any other questions before we wrap? All right. Thank you, Derek. Cool. Thanks.